Hi, this is Frank Taylor with Nature at Your Door. It's early August and I'm in the Appalachian Mountains and I'm by a catalpa tree, sometimes called a catabo tree. And in my hand, you can see that I've got some what are known locally as catalpa worms. What is a catalpa worm? What does it eat? Why is it on this tree? What's its life cycle? Why do bass fishermen love these as well as the bass? What's the history of these, this tree and these catalpa worms? And how did they get their names? All of this and more is in today's episode on the catalpa tree and catalpa worms. Right here in your backyard, you never know what you're going to find. And here's the make this invasive. It's exotic. Dogwoods are flowering. And I just took a couple swipes. Terrestrial environment. Uh, produce seed pollen. And it's. Let's begin this episode with a discussion of the catalpa tree. I think it's such a cool tree. I was visiting my brother in St. Louis, Missouri. He has a huge catalpa tree in his yard, which may be approaching a record size for their state. There are two species of catalpa. There's the northern catalpa and the southern catalpa. The northern catalpa tree tends to be taller and have a straighter trunk, while the southern catalpa tends to divide more at the base. In fact, some people will cut it back so that it will spread more for the purpose of catalpa worms. I'll tell you who those people are in a minute. One of the really interesting things about the catalpa tree is that both the northern and southern species had a very limited original range. In fact, if you see a catalpa tree, unless you're in one of these very limited ranges, it's not a native to where you live. The northern catalpa's original range was in a narrow band of the, in the Ohio and Mississippi valleys. And the southern catalpa was found in a band across the central part of Mississippi, Alabama, and to Georgia. First catalpa trees were identified and seen in Cherokee fields in the south. You can identify catalpa trees by these large heart-shaped leaves these bean pods and mature trees that are very long and hang and look a little bit like cigars. So they are sometimes called cigar tree or bean tree. An interesting thing about the catalpa tree is this is one of the few trees that still carry the name given to them by the indigenous peoples. The name catalpa is a derivative of the Muscogee word the Muscogee word was kutalapa, and the word kutalapa means winged seeds and refer to the small seeds with wings on them that are carried in the seed pods of this tree. A confusing common name, especially locally here in Virginia, I've often hear it called a catabo tree and the caterpillars on the tree, catabo worms. Well, that's really a misnomer because the catabo were a tribe of indigenous peoples that were native to the area of North Carolina and really don't have anything to do with this tree. To identify the tree itself, if you see these catalpa worms on it, then you can be sure it's a catalpa tree because catalpa worms do not feed on any other tree. And in fact, the catalpa tree doesn't have any other species of caterpillars on it. Catalpa worms are the only ones that have co-evolved and adapted to the toxins that this tree produces in order to reduce herbivory. The tree contains iridoid glycosides that make it unpalatable for both species. Species that co-evolve together over long periods of time often have these checks and balances and the caterpillars take on some of these glycosides and make them unpalatable for a lot of species but not apparently for bass or catfish. We'll get back to that again. These caterpillars, when they're this size, are pretty easy to identify. They have yellow sides with black flecks along them, a very distinct, brilliant dark band of black on the back, and the characteristic 
horn on its tail. Caterpillars in this family do have this characteristic horn and in this family also includes the tobacco hornworm and the tomato hornworm which are more familiar to gardeners and they all have this horn at the base of their abdomen. The family they're in is the sphinx moth or hawk moth family. The scientific name is Sphingidae, and the adult moth of this catalpa caterpillar is called a catalpa sphinx moth and it's a very unremarkable brown moth that would be hard to distinguish from other brown moths. The interesting fact about the adults is that in some of the literature I read they indicate that this moth doesn't actually have a mouth so as an adult it doesn't even feed and so its function as an adult is to mate and if it's a female to lay eggs. Eggs are laid on trees in groups of up to a thousand. So a single tree may have thousands of eggs on it and result in thousands of caterpillars on the same tree. The tree at my brother's house, I didn't find a single caterpillar. And this tree, as you can see, is inundated with caterpillars. So it's a kind of boom or bust. There are some years in the cycle where there's many, many caterpillars on trees, and then there's other years where they're not seen. As you can see, a population of caterpillars on a tree can completely devastate it and defoliate it. But like organisms that co-evolve with each other, there's checks and balances. It's never to the caterpillar's advantage, in this case, to do kill the host tree. And so there's always a balance. Being a native species, they also have native predators that have evolved with them. And one of the organisms that keep the caterpillar population in check is a braconid wasp. The braconid wasp lays its eggs in developing caterpillars, actually inserts the egg with its ovipositor into the caterpillar underneath its skin, and the eggs hatch out inside, and the larva parasitize and eat the insides of the caterpillar. When the larvae are mature and ready to pupate, they will drill a hole out of the caterpillar, spin a cocoon, and pupate inside. The pretty gruesome way of life. In the south, catalpa trees can be subjected to two generations of catalpa worms. In the north, there is only one generation. Another check and balance on these guys is provided by ants and another fascinating co-evolved situation. When the catalpa tree is damaged by eating by these caterpillars, it singles some reactions in the tree and the tree will develop what are called extra floral nectaries in the edges of the leaf. What does that mean? Extra floral means outside of the flowers. Nectaries mean the production of nectar. And so they'll produce sugar at the edges of the leaves where they're damaged by the caterpillars. Why? Because that sugar will attract ants. And ants are voracious protectors of their food sources. So the ants will come up to get this sugar on the single by the tree and attack the caterpillars that are eating the leaves. Amazing sequence of coevolution, the catalpa tree, the catalpa caterpillars, the ants, the broken broconid wasps, everything just works together in an ecosystem. Remember that ecosystems are disrupted by invasive species that often grow without checks and balances. And I brought this example up before like the gypsy moth caterpillar that devastates oak forests and just completely destroy and kill oak trees. These caterpillars won't kill the trees unless it's an unusual sequence of year to year to year, uh, uh, all in a row. Typically, again, hosts and parasites that co-evolve, that it is not in the parasite's interest to end up killing the tree. And the catalpa tree has the ability to grow leaves back after these leaves have been eaten. 
these worms at this stage, I keep calling them worms, but they're not worms, they're caterpillars. But locally, that's what they're called by my friends that are fishermen. They are just amazing and really brilliantly colored, and they're so big. Well, these ones that are arriving at this final molt or instar are going to enter the next phase of their life, which is called the wandering phase. The wandering phase. At this phase, they leave the tree, sometimes just dropping from the leaves, sometimes climbing down the trunk, and they begin to wander. Why are they wandering? They're looking for a place to pupate that's safe and meets the right environmental conditions. And they will dig down two to three inches in the soil, form a chamber, pupate inside that chamber. If it's a southern catalpa and it's midsummer, it will uh, emerge from the pupa and finish the life cycle. If it's in the fall, in the north or the south, it'll overwinter as that pupa and finally come out in the spring to repeat its life cycle. So I said earlier, the original catalpa trees had a very limited range, but these trees seem to go well, grow well all across the United States, outside of their original range. Here in Virginia, they're common, but they're not native. Why are they common? Well, because the wood of the catalpa is very resistant to rot, and also the catalpa trees grow very fast. So a lot of people planted them for their use as railroad ties and as fence posts. Other people plant them for, for its fishing value. In the South, there's many fishermen that say there is no better bait than the catalpa worms for catfish. And here in my area, the bass fishermen say, hey, there's no better bait for smallmouth or largemouth bass than catalpa worms. And that's because a lot of catalpa trees will grow along the sides of rivers and streams and lakes, and the catalpa worms that fall in are greedily gobbled up. So it makes sense that the fish learn this is a great thing to eat. And for some reason, that toxicity doesn't seem to uh, affect them at all. And lastly, a lot of people planted catalpa trees for their ornamental value. They produce gorgeous, large flowers on spikes, and they're really beautiful to see in the spring. Other gardeners say they're kind of a dirty tree because they'll leave the bean pods and the flower parts, and you have to clean up after them. But the fishermen, boy, they really like to plant them now and have catalpa worms for fishing each year. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Nature at Your Door and learning about catalpa trees, these catalpa worms, their natural history, how they live together, and a lot of other things. If you like my channel, if you like what I do, please subscribe if you haven't already. Give me a like and leave me a comment. I love answering questions and uh, responding to comments that viewers leave at the end of my videos in the comment section. I'll get back to you as soon as I can. If I'm not out in the field filming something like this or taking long several day hikes in the woods and backpacking, which is the only thing that keeps me away from the internet these days. Thanks for watching. Nature at your door.